Hi, this is Guy Wallace. I'd like to talk to you about my new book, Conducting Performance-Based Instructional Analysis. I wrote this book after having a discussion with Dr. Richard E. Clark, Dick Clark, uh, when I was doing an HPT video with him back on June 30th of uh, 2020, the year of the pandemic. Um, and after our video recording, I asked him about a comment that he had made during the uh, video recording, and that was that he would never put together a group of subject matter experts to interview them for his cognitive task analysis methodology. Now, there are many cognitive task analysis, CTA, methodologies uh, out there on the market, so to speak. Uh, I think it was about uh, 8, 9, 10, 11 years ago that he and I had a discussion and he shared with me that he and his colleague, Ken Yates, had investigated uh, over 100 different CTA methodologies and they found most of them lacking, the great majority of them lacking. And that they found, I think it was five or six that uh, held promise, that actually tried to do what they were uh, purporting to do. Um, and th that there were only two or three of them that were actually capable of doing what they claimed. Um, but what had gotten to me was that I've been using what I call a, uh, nowadays a facilitated group process to conduct my instructional analysis efforts uh, in my analysis phase, if you will. And I've uh, always formed a group of uh, folks that I call master performers and other subject matter experts if needed. But what I'm really looking for is somebody who actually knows the job, can do the job, can talk about the job. And of course, what uh, Dick Clark is trying to get at with his cognitive task analysis methodologies and what I've been trying to get at is the fact that um, what I learned from him eight, nine, 10, 11 years ago was that uh, we're all operating on non-conscious knowledge. And if you were to ask an expert uh, what is needed by a novice, the expert can give you about 30% of what a novice truly needs. They will forget because it's non-conscious, they've automated that thinking, and so they no longer have to think about it as they do it. They can perform, but they don't, they can't tell you what they're doing. You'd have to observe them, and of course you can see the physical behaviors of people, but you can't see the cognitive behaviors of people and determine, you know, what discriminations are they making, what decisions are they making, how are they making those decisions, etc., etc., which is, of course, important when you're training uh, people due to the job and how to do the job. So I've been using my instructional analysis methodologies focused with a, a, a facilitated group process with experts, performance experts, other subject matter experts, sometimes managers and supervisors, sometimes even novice performers. I've been doing that since 1979. And when I became a consultant, an instructional systems design consultant in 1982, that was the mainstay for my consulting practices when I conducted uh, modular curriculum development is what I call it. Other people have it as an addy like model. That's my addy like model. There's, of course, many different models for these thing kinds of things. And of course, it's not an instructional design model. It's a project planning framework for conducting instructional systems design, instructional design, uh, learning experience uh, design kinds of projects to produce instructional content which to me is both job aids and training. And if it, training isn't needed, maybe you need to create a communications to create awareness, maybe you need education to create knowledge, maybe you need training to create skills. But in an enterprise learning context, we should be able to define what the terminal performance objectives are. And when I talk about performance, I'm thinking about both the tasks and the outputs the tasks lead to. And of course, both tasks within a process that produces outputs. Both tasks and outputs most likely have requirements, stakeholder requirements. Downstream customers require certain things, regulators might require certain things, uh, internally uh, management executives, middle management, uh, quality assurance folks might expect certain kinds of things. Now I have 
two primary uh, instructional design methodologies. The first one is curriculum architecture design. It doesn't produce any new training, but a lot of what I talk about in my new book applies to curriculum architecture design. It determines the need, it designs a system of instruction, and then goes to the management of the target audience to get prioritization so that they should know where to invest their limited resources for instructional purposes to improve performance. And they ought to be able to see, you know, in, an, in a curriculum architecture design, what content will give them the biggest bang for the buck. The economic value add, the return on investment, lots of different language for this, and you need to understand how your organization looks at those kinds of things. Talk to your uh, folks in the chief financial officer's uh, uh, organization to determine how your organization calculates uh, value for making investments. Um, one curriculum architecture design effort kind of leads to multiple development efforts. Now I have two methodologies for that. They're pretty much the same. One is MCD, modular curriculum development. And the other one is instructional activity development, because I've been asked before by clients to produce components of future instructional products. They might want performance tests produced early, first, and then the instruction to prepare people to pass those tests later on. It depends on the needs of the business, and I've tried to be flexible, but the focus of the new book is on MCD, Modular Curriculum Development. It is my Addy-like methodology set. I started this book on June 30th, right after talking to Dr. Clark, and I, wanted, I started to write a white paper to send to him to explain my methodologies and why I like using a team, a group, of master performers and even though they may not agree with themselves uh, each other and they may argue amongst themselves I found it very insightful when they have those kinds of uh, disagreements arguments when they question and challenge each other I learn a lot in terms of what's important and I also learn that they may have simply uh, semantic differences in how they describe performance and they've got to test each other out, uh, clarify with each other, you know, what did you mean by that? Uh, so then I, st so I started in June 30th. I wrote this white paper and I was writing the white paper and I realized perhaps a day into it that this was really a book and not a white paper. And that began my journey to write the book. Now I published the book November 10th, so it was just uh, you know, four months and, and 10 days approximately to for me to produce this book. And it's 416 pages. I borrowed some content from some of my prior writings um, because I wanted to stay true to what I'd written in the past because what I'd written in the past works and that's really all part of this. But my approach in this was that um, instructional analysis doesn't happen at one time in the course of an instructional development project. In my view, it starts at the very beginning when you get a request and you do what some might call an intake process, and that's how I describe it in the book, it's an intake process. How do I take in that request, clarify that request, not challenge the request, but try to understand uh, what that is needed? Now, I learned from the late Joe Harless back in the mid 80s to never challenge a client when they brought you a request for training. And he, I remember at a conference uh, back in the mid 80s, he made the comment uh, in front of uh, all assembled and it was either a keynote or it was a, a, key, a presentation uh, in one of the sessions where he said, don't ask your client in your whiniest voice, are you sure it's a training problem? I think he was tired of what was going around there. We shouldn't be order takers, we should push back. And he didn't like the idea that we might push back. He taught me, and many others, to always say yes. Yes, I can help you with that request, and I can help you even more if we can do a little front-end analysis. Now, that was his phrase, front-end analysis, for what I'm simply calling instructional analysis. And I'm doing analysis through all the phases. So uh, as I go into my own methodology, um, I... I, I do this throughout the whole book, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So I wrote this first draft of the book. I, I did a video then back on July 10th 
11 days after I started, here's my first draft, and I sat out here on my deck in my backyard and talked a little bit about this book and what it was and what I was trying to accomplish. Um, and I posted that on my website, and it was a YouTube video. And a friend of mine that I've known for probably about 30 years now, Ann Battenfield, I've known her from uh, ISPI. Uh, she was part of the Chicago chapter and part of the international organization, and that's been my professional home since 1979. But uh, Ann reached out to me and uh, to see if I would be interested in using her as an editor. Of course, that was ideal because... <laughs> Those who know me know that I needed an editor. Um, so I worked with her and uh, we went through a number of iterations. I think the final version of the book was like V12 or something like that. And uh, um, so I then reached out to my net professional network and asked 28 people if they would be willing to review my book to give me feedback before I finished it up. So the book was probably about 80, 90 percent, I was hoping, you know, 95 percent, but it turned out not to be. So it was probably closer to 80 percent. So I got a significant amount of feedback across 24 people who were able to review the book and give me feedback. And there was a lot of consistency in the feedback, and of course there was a lot of, there was other inconsistencies, you know, change the title, change the cover, which I did. Um, but there were, there were some one-off comments that, uh, that I, I didn't follow, but I did take to heart a lot of what was said. And this is my early review team, 24 people. Um, so the, they helped me reshape the book. Uh, I reconfigured the chapters into sections and such like that. So let me talk to you a little bit about the section. So section A is instructional analysis throughout a development effort. Analysis doesn't just happen in the analysis phase. In my view, it happens in the project planning and kickoff phase, which is the front end of that is the intake process. Then there's clarification with other stakeholders. There's a decision to be made as to whether this is worthy of our attention, our efforts. Uh, then we would do project planning and then meet with a, a, a team that I call the project steering team, my client, and their key clients or the other stakeholders in the organization who are, have a, a vested interest in the project. And I would share with them the project plan and work with them to massage that, to, to make it uh, feasible, realistic, and, and to make sure that we were focused on meeting their business needs, which was to improve performance, not to just to create a, a set of learning content. Um, but so the first part of the book in section A, I go through the six phases of my MCD model and discuss, give a highlight, an advanced organizer, if you will, for each of those phases and what kind of analysis happens in each of those phases. What kind of analysis happens in design phase, in the development phase, and what I call the pilot test phase and the revision and release phase. So there's analysis throughout the process. Uh, and I believe that I've avoided um, uh, analysis paralysis because I've not tried to do analysis all in one fell swoop. Um, I've strewn it out across my project planning framework, the MCD six phases. In section B of the book, then I talk about specifically in phase one, project planning and kickoffs, the specific types of analysis that I do. And I don't always call it analysis because not everybody likes uh, analysis because they associate it with analysis paralysis. So that's something to be avoided. In the next section, C, I talk about in phase two, the analysis phase, the four types of analysis that I do. These are my standard defaults. I do this in MCD, I do it in IAD, I do it in the CAD, the CAD processes, all my analysis methodologies. We do four types of analysis. We do target audience analysis because we really need to understand who is the target audience and you know, what can we safely assume about them and what is not safe to assume about them? So as we're thinking about how we're constructing instruction and how we're modulizing that content, we need to make sure that we modulize the content to meet the target audience's needs. Do they all have the very same job assignment, even though they have the same job title, or does that vary? Uh, do some of them come in with varied, different uh, incoming knowledge and skills, or are they pretty much all the same? So those are the kinds of things we're trying to determine when we're doing 
target audience analysis. The second thing is then understand for that target audience, what are the performance requirements? What are the outputs that are to be produced? How do you know a good one from a bad one? What are the tasks performed? Who is doing those tasks? Are you doing those all by yourself or are you doing those with a team effort with other job titles? And then because I'm working with master performers who theoretically have are able to do the job to a level of mastery, I'm trying to then I try to do a gap analysis with that performance data as to what are the issues for the non-master performers. If there are master performers and non-master performers, what's up with the non-master performers and where are they falling short? And what do the master performers believe are the issues that are causing non-master performers to not uh, achieve mastery? Now, just because you can get a group of master performers or anybody to come to consensus on something doesn't make them right but it does give you a heads up and points you in a direction to, for investigation to determine whether or not uh, what they believe is at the root of non-master performers inability to be master performers you know so what are the secrets so master performers in my view um, they understand what the job requires uh, they understand what the barriers are to performance they understand how to avoid those barriers in the first place and then if the barriers are unavoidable in the second place how do they recover what do they do what are their strategies and tactics and that's what I tried to gather in my instructional design and development efforts uh, since entering the business in 1979 so we focus on phase two we want to understand that uh, the performance then we want to understand what are the enabling knowledge and skills my third type of analysis that I'm doing and then the fourth type is I assess existing content for its reuse potential so four types of analysis that happen in the analysis phase target audience performance and performance gaps enabling knowledge and skills and assessment of existing content for its reuse potential. What can we use as is and what might we have to modify so we can use it after modification. Um, the third phase of MCD is design. Now I'm using the analysis data that's produced and I have a mechanical kind of process for taking a group of master performers who help generate the analysis data and then I facilitate them in creating designs and when we're doing that if we do this right we're always open to adding to the analysis data now what I felt about analysis data coming out of the analysis phase is that it was always pretty much accurate not always but you know pretty darn close the issue that I've uh, uncovered discovered new since early in my career is that it's most likely incomplete and I learned that by over time having people add to the initial analysis data making it more and more complete over time throughout the project and that was a, a wake-up call for me back in the early days back in the late 70s early 80s was that uh, you talk to master performers and somebody else would add to what they had said and then you'd have to go around and check with everybody and so I always found that the bringing people into a room uh, in a group process was the ideal thing. We could resolve any uh, differences um, in language, of opinion, of approaches uh, in a team effort and decide on, well, how there's may, maybe many ways to do this, but how shall we train new hires, people new to the job? And so that was the goal in that, and that's what we're trying to do in design. We're trying to facilitate the design process with the analysis data, but being open to adding to that analysis data as we're doing the design. Then when we get into the development phase, that's actually where most analysis actually happens. That's where I would use Dick Clark's cognitive task analysis approach, because that's where I'm trying to get to the most complete set of content that provides instruction to the learners slash performers, the people who have to go perform back on the job. So I'm taking my analysis data, creating a design. When I've got a design, I get that signed off. I'm going to 
uh, into a development mode where I'm taking that design and fleshing it out, so to speak, and making the content then more and more complete. It was accurate to start with, it just wasn't complete. Um, and so you're adding all the content that's necessary to help a new person develop initial mastery or begin the road to mastery depends on what you're teaching them and how hard it is uh, for people to learn it and that all depends on how difficult the performance itself is the the concepts etc that that need to be understood what the incoming knowledge and skills are of the audience etc but uh, so in development we're really doing that now I produce an alpha set of content the first drafts if you will a beta set of content, second drafts, if you will, and I'm gearing up to create the third draft, which I call the pilot test versions of my content. So alpha, beta, pilot test. You can call it whatever you want. It's called many different things here. I'm not sure where I got the language of pilot test. It was early in my career. It's just something that uh, that uh, I picked up. Um, again, call it whatever is appropriate in your business context uh, that uh, will help people understand what it is you're trying to do. Um, but I'm creating that pilot test content to get ready for the uh, fifth phase of MCD, which is pilot testing. Now, I've pulled pilot testing out of the development phase, whereas in most instructional design development models, frameworks, you'll find that kind of testing buried in development. But I pulled it out and made it a separate phase so I could highlight that and I could talk to my clients about how that was going to be a full destructive test. Uh, that's what we were gearing up for. I wanted them to take it seriously. I wanted them to help me test it. I, I always asked them for two types of, of the target audience in there. I needed uh, the, the target audience themselves new hires or people new to the job or whoever the target audience was. It could have been the intermediate and advanced uh, performers. Um, but I, I needed them so that I could determine and measure pre and post knowledge and skills. Did they learn anything in the, in, in the training session? Um, now, those people can't tell you whether what they learned was accurate, complete, or even appropriate. And so the second target group that I would have in a pilot test session would be additional master performers who haven't been involved in the project to this point. And I may need other subject matter experts, people from the quality organization or from regulatory affairs or or uh, whatever is appropriate to the kind of content that's being uh, um, pilot tested. And the, those people cannot, I can't measure learning with them theoretically. They know it already. So I can't measure pre, what do they know before they, we, we did the training, what do they know once the training is done, I can't measure that with them. But I need them to tell me whether or not the content was truly accurate and complete, and most importantly, appropriate. Things can be accurate and complete and inappropriate for this target audience at this point in their development. Um, and so those are, those are tricky things. And so I need those two sets of voices to help me determine through the pilot testing, do I have the right instructional content? What do I need to change before I release this for general availability so people can go get it or it's pushed to them or it's made accessible to them, whatever the case may be, whatever the design calls for. After the pilot test, then we're doing revision and release. Now, if we've gotten some negative feedback about certain portions of the content, we may have to go back and do analysis to plug those gaps, to bring that content up to speed, so to speak, so that it is accurate, complete. And appropriate. Um, and then because of my approach uh, in one of the other models that I have, um, I, I have this uh, model, the training and development systems view. It's a clock face model. There's 12 positions on the clock face, of course, and underneath those 12 subsystems of a training and development or learning and development system, I've got 47 processes. And MCD is one of the processes at six o'clock, and but that's the new product development process. Uh, so your ADDIE model, which at the end has implementation and evaluation, the I and the E, that's not part of MCD. And so in my approach to this thing, I kind of take a manufacturing approach. I have uh, engineering, manufacturing, engineering, producing the product, and then they send it off to someplace so that it gets 
ordered or shipped or whatever is appropriate and so that's implementation and when we're doing implementation we're deploying content and we have a chance to evaluate it we can get evaluation data from the from the trainees or the learners if you will uh, from any facilitators or coaches that may be a part of the deployment from management of the target audience whose people have gone through the instruction um, and so that's where the evaluation happens now and that my model that's at six o'clock and so beyond MCD there are systems in an organization or there could be or should be systems in an organization that conduct the evaluation as uh, concurrent with the deployment or after as part of the deployment effort and so the book addresses what kind of information are we looking for and how do we use that and then we wrap up the book section i is the book summary and some closing comments and all of that stuff so in my case as in many cases it takes a village to do good work and again these are my early reviewers uh, i appreciate very much uh, their contributions to my effort uh, to my development and to the development of my book um, I have uh, uh, great respect for Ann Battenfield, who was my very patient editor, very patient with me, um, um, because I have a tendency to break all the uh, Chicago Style Guide rules or whatever style guide we were using. I can't even remember. Um, th those things are important. Um, I'm just not well versed in them and consistent with them, but I do appreciate the fact that that's necessary. So the book is available now as a Kindle and a paperback. came out November 10th, and uh, you can uh, order it. There's the, there's the URL at the bottom of the slide there. Um, again, I've been conducting instructional analysis this way pretty much since uh, 1979 is when I started. By the time I became uh, an external consultant in 1982, this was pretty much my methodology. Um, it's changed in terms of the framework and some of the language slightly, but it's been pretty consistent to this since, uh, since the mid 80s, probably at the latest. Um, I'm Guy Wallace. I'm a performance analyst and instructional architect. I've been doing this since 1979 and I've been doing external ISD consulting since 1982. My business is Epic, the Enterprise Process Performance Improvement Consultancy. And here's my URL for my website. Thank you for listening.